Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to our Tabula Rasa online retreat. I'm Peter, and I'm going to be the host this weekend. And this weekend, we're uh, coming in live from La Casa de Milagros in Chapala in Mexico. We're just in the midst of a mystery school that's happening here too. And so we have a full weekend ahead of us. But for this starting session, we're going to be joined by Lisa Fair, David Hofmeister and Francis Su. And I'll cut it over to you guys right now. Hi, everyone. <laughs> We're, we have our live studio audience and our worldwide audience. So there's all these hands waving. <laughs> yeah, I always felt that uh, Jesus would tell me for years that it's, he said, don't get too concerned about the world. It's a virtual world. <laughs> and then uh, right before the pandemic, he was saying, it's time for a digital revolution, which is just a remembrance that it's a virtual world that the world's not outside of our mind. So we shouldn't uh, get too ticked off about the world. If we forgive it, then we can be happy. So here we are. Lisa, Francis, we're here with all of you to share the Hi joy. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Tabula Rasa <laughs> with us. Beautiful. Yeah. It's just beautiful. I was just talking uh, with Lisa and Francis, and I think um, back around, I think it was around 1999, uh, I had this inspiration to do a newsletter. And so I, I made the, the first issue, and I called it Tabula Rasa. And it was a beautiful, beautiful issue, and it had a woman with both of her, her hands outstretched her fingers up and she was she had her head back and there were flowers falling all around her and that was on the the cover and then it turned into a symbol like with Jesus everything is a symbol it was a newsletter of one issue <laughs> that was back in 1999 that was how long it ran <laughs> it was it, it, there was no second issue even though that issue, I know, touched Lisa, she got a hold of it and she was praying in her house and reading it in her God room. And every day, day after day, that one issue went a long way. But that was 22 years ago, and that was quite an experience. Mm, yeah, we were talking this morning just how profound. Because I remember when I met you, you know, all these shifts and changing changes were going on, and... Just like, you know, you were this living demonstration and just this little newsletter for me as I was just going through all my healing and letting go, just reading it every day. I, I read it all the time because it was more about the mystical experience, about how you can live your life and be happy all the time and living in the unknown and not having a care for the world and just how, you know, I would read this uh Tabla Rasa. I, mean, I actually could cry about it. And almost like I'd read it in reference to being with you. Like I would be reading it and think, and I'd watch you. And it was like you were living this newsletter that had appeared. And I'm like looking at it, this one issue. And I'd be like, oh, just to imagine that I could live and uh, in this spontaneity and be free of cares and worry and be happy all the time. And and that newsletter just was like my Bible, really. And I felt like it was just like, oh, I want to read about this experience. Just, yeah, and just today, yeah, it just feels so beautiful. Like this, um, seemingly this mystery school is this gift from the spirit for me just to practice that and to really be in this experience of praying and not knowing, truly not knowing, and being open to be shown every day what he would have me do. You know, what is your will for me, Father, you know, to use me and to be truly helpful? And just in this wide open, truly helpful experience, really not knowing. There's no curriculum. I was telling you guys today that the 
the lessons have been profound because every morning I eagerly, it's like Jesus curriculum. He's showing us the curriculum every day. And it's so fun because I don't even go ahead in the lessons. I can't wait to wake up in the morning and say, oh, what does Jesus have for me today to open to and to practice myself? So it's like this continual opening that I'm experiencing in this unknown and just such a gift because even we didn't even know we were going to do this till yesterday. You know, in this continual expansion of jumping into the unknown. And, and you guys here at the Mystery School, I mean, every day, you know, is kind of, it's, it's expanding us. It's stepping into just kind of trusting Jesus at such a deep level. You know, you were saying this morning about faith, uh, that this is really just a practice in faith. And, you know, it's the continual daily process of jumping into the unknown, which is an honor really yeah that's a that is a beautiful launch into spiritual awakening is faith and you might remember jesus had said uh after he returned after the resurrection and he returned to the apostles and um they were all coming up to him and talking with him and it was thomas uh doubting thomas who basically you know, had to come up and touch Jesus' um, arms because that's where the, the wounds had been. And then Jesus turned and he looked at Thomas and said, blessed are those who have seen and who believe. Far greater blessed are those who have not seen and who believe. That's the faith. That's a, that's a very recent um, workbook lesson we just had in the workbook of A Course in Miracles. I will not use the body's eyes today. That's pointing to faith. How else are you going to live your day without using the body's eyes except through faith? Mm. Uh, through just <coughs> living in what is given in the moment. Of taking no thought for the morrow, Jesus said 2,000 years ago. How would you live if you took no thought for what tomorrow would bring? How would you live if, if you followed what Jesus said 2,000 years ago? Take no thought for what you shall wear or what you shall eat. You know, he was giving a practical gateway into the experience of faith and living in the present moment. And someone wrote in, you know, well, I've, I've focused for the longest time just on my body, but now I want to know how to go into the holy instant. I want to know how to live in faith without the thoughts and the needs for what will I do. And it does remind me of, of the workbook too, Lesson 135, where we've referred to that lesson so many times, but Jesus says, a healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan. All of us have been raised, all of our programming from the ego and the past has, has said, you have to plan for the future. And if you can get good at planning for the future, then you're a successful, functioning human being. You're a successful, functioning citizen. What is the purpose of education if it isn't for planning for the future? What would be the point of learning things, learning skills and abilities if it wasn't for the survival of the body in the future? If you had the awareness that you have everything and are everything right now, what would you need education for? What would you need to upgrade your skills and abilities for? What would you need, need to learn more of if you realize that you have and are everything right now? You know, that's, what, that's the third lesson of the Holy Spirit in, in the text <coughs> where you have the realization that, yeah. of that having and being are the same. If what you have is what you are, why would you seek for more of anything. 
And there's a very famous section in the later part of the text called Beyond All Idols. Some of you might remember that section. It's interesting that Jesus starts it off with, what is an idol do you think you know? Because most of us know that the Bible said, hold no idols before the Lord thy God. You know, that, that's part of our commandments. But what is an idol? It's not talking about a, a, a golden statue. It's saying that the world of images is the world of idols. And when you focus your mind on any of these images as being important, more important than God, more important than spirit, more important than the present moment, you are focusing on an idol. And then he goes on to say, he starts off with, what is an idol? Do you think you know? He goes on to say, an idol is for more of something. It does not matter more of what. So more is the concept of, is the idol. When you want more of anything, when you want more of, of even of an experience or more of an object or more of an image, it doesn't really matter more of what. You are not in the moment. You are not in the contentment of the holy instant. And that was one of our questions. We had some questions today was, how do I live this? How do I enter into the holy instant? And we always are talking about guidance, just living in the given, what is given. Every single day, every single lesson, uh, you were just sharing how uh, our, our Susanna was sharing with you how there's such peace in not having to think about decisions, making decisions in the future, just accepting what's given. Yes. You know, when, when we um, normally operating, the way we operate in the world is we think we know something and we think that we can be in control. And it's almost like a good thing to know that we're in control. But gradually on this journey, um, that's what Susanna and I were talking about, you realize actually to be responsible for anything brings up fear because that is not the reality that we are responsible for the world of images, including ourselves, including the behaviors, including other people, including the awakening. It's, it actually is the opposite of, of the reality because we, ha we ha are responsible for our mind. And when we think re we are responsible for anything else is a direct denial of, of this one responsibility. And inevitably there is fear so in the daily life, we can walk around and think, it's a good thing I can decide on this. I can choose. I can make choices. I can do whatever I want. But at some point, we realize, wow, it's, it's actually there is an unconscious fear that just sits there. And we don't know how to truly feel the peace. And... I feel like this is the reason that we, we even come together in the weekend because somewhere inside we know we're here to listen to the thoughts and the voice of the spirit. And that gives us peace. And this is what we have an experience of, to be able to join together and tune into the voice of the spirit. It gives us peace. And this can be lived, and it, this can be an experience that peace can be always here for us and always um, available. But it is such a habit to tune in to no other voice but the voice of the Spirit. And what David was referring to was uh, Susanna and, and I were talking because she has been, um, you know, sh she was married, she's married still, but she, she could, she need to make a lot of decisions around her house, around what she does, around the, the daily decisions. But recently she has an experience where 
she was given so many things to do seemingly, but they were they were guided um, tasks. And when she can let herself relax into it, let her day just from the moment she wakes up in the morning till the moment she goes to sleep, just to to realize, oh, I don't have to make any of the decisions about my day anymore because they're all given to me. And then she tapped into this deep peace she hasn't experienced for a long time. And that, what we were talking about was that Jesus said, don't, don't think you can understand any of it until you pass the, 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 the test of perfect peace. So we, we, we're not able to really understand what this is about, what guidance is about, what the spirit is about, what autonomy is about, until we actually have an experience of perfect peace. Then we understand what brings us peace. Mm -hmm. So this is truly the, the central, um, the central message of the course, which is let the spirit guide you and have an experience of the peace. Even this morning before I came, I had a few minutes before I came to, uh, to the studio and I thought I'll just flip over the book just to see whether Jesus has anything to say before I came. And the sentence was, you'll be told of ev everything. <laughs> That's if there is one message, you will be told of everything. There's no other message. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how how Jesus says this course is not a course in knowledge. The goal of the course is not knowledge. The goal of the course is peace and inner peace, peace of mind. So if that's the goal and we're told that it can only be experienced in the present moment, then that again points to opening to an experience of what the present moment truly means because that's where the peace must be in the present moment. But if you've associated thought with the past or if you've associated thought with the future, then all those thoughts about the past or the future are the blocks to the holy instant, to the present moment. So. The Course in Miracles gives us a, a means called the miracle and, and a means called guidance, basically tapping into guidance. And there seems to be a lot of beliefs around even guidance. We did a whole retreat one time in the past couple years on guidance. And the, the whole focus and the emphasis on in the retreat was that guidance is always just to bring you into the present moment. It's never for anything in the world. Oftentimes people talk about, I want to be guided so that I can be financially sound and set. Or I want to be guided to a particular partner or to a particular set of circumstances or a particular situation. That's not the purpose of guidance. Guidance is simply to release all thoughts of the past and future and come into a state of pure being in which you realize you have everything and are everything and have always been everything in this simple, simple state of mind. When we say simple, even the word simple has many meanings in the world, but it's almost like Jesus touched this very simple experience, almost if we use the metaphor of the body, like under your nose. So as you chase around and look everywhere, for it, it's under your nose. <laughs> it's Jesus is laughing. No, 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 don't. <laughs> don't try to make this too complicated. It's closer than the air that you breathe. It's closer than your breath. It's that close to you. That's what the kingdom of heaven is. It's closer than anything that you perceive in this world. So to me, that's where the allowance and per permission comes in. And once you come into this acceptance, then 
you are simply observing and watching the world. You're not trying to, to judge it. You're not trying to take a side. You're not trying to have an opinion. You're not trying to have a preference even. You're just letting all things be exactly as they are. You're just really accepting that all things are exactly as they are. So this is something that can be experienced, but it's not something that can be transferred in words. We're just letting the words come from the experience. We're letting them, like the flower gives off its fragrance, we're just sending that fragrance off and extending it, but, but the joy is in the moment, and that's what we, we have such gratitude, that's where the glory of God is, is in this very moment. It is also very practical because when you're in the moment, then everything is given you that, that you are to share and to extend. If it's a word, if it's just to be silent, if it's just to feel the grace of God's love, that is everything. So it's not understandable, as Francis was saying, you can't first seek for understanding and then arrive at the, p the peace. You have to arrive at the peace and the understanding goes together with the peace. Peace and understanding go together and cannot be found apart. So that takes it off of the wheel mm. of trying, like a hamster, trying to chase after it. Everything we've done as a human being has, has been about productivity, it's been about self-improvement, it's been about make the world a better place, make yourself better than it was in the past. But it's a trick. Who you are in the moment is not a, a really a matter of better or worse. Who's judging? <laughs> who's, who's judging? Not God, <laughs> who knows us as we are. It's only the ego that is trying to put up this uh, smoke screen. So what a, what a joyful time we have. We're, this is our life. We are in tabula rasa. <laughs> and even though the, the newsletter, one issue came out back around 1999, we're still in the moment, you know, because this is really the only moment there ever is or was or will be. <laughs> it's quite a ride because it really is letting go and, and just watching. It's a surrender just to, you know, I love that, would you say, because I remember that's like on page 11 of the course. I remember uh, reading that for the first time. It said, you are and have everything right now in complete abundance. And uh, I remember reading that, and at the time I really didn't believe that at all, and I thought, you are and have everything right now in complete abundance. And, and it's like this, just sitting here listening to you, I remember just reading it over and over and over again that that was the truth, you know, and that it's an experience. It's not just the word. It's, it's an entering into that holy instant, too, to feel that grace to acceptance, accepting that that is who we are. So, yeah, I just feel like it's a spontaneous. We were talking about how we're in this kind of like there's a waves going in the and the sand when you're in, in the waves, how the sand is moving. And it's this purification that's happening, you know, as we're just riding in these waves you know, it's like this wave of healing that's continually happening, but it's pulling us into the present moment. That's what I feel for myself is just like, you know, that's the only thing that, yeah, like it's the only thing that really is valuable. Like everything else is a trick. And to be so present and feel the presence of the Spirit and feel the presence of God and just watching in amazement, watching in the wonder you know, this morning I woke up and it was like I walked in the, like I've, n like truly, like it's everything becomes so brand new. There's no past reference to what's happening. So, you know, even just this morning, just this, oh wow, the, the sun looks so bright today. The trees look so beautiful and 
and and the red was never so red and just walking through this opening to be shown like a little child you know that i don't know the way and and just feeling this love and this grace and yeah so it's 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 beyond words just there's no words i just want to keep you know watching in wonder and what we really want to do today is is come to extreme extreme simplicity and practicality because you may be listening to the words that are being shared from this state of mind and may be saying i wish or sentimentally i agree with you sentimentally i agree with the words that are being spoken but and the but can be a sense of anger or annoyance or irritation a sense of disgust a sense of frustration a sense of of the human condition uh the the simple frustrations that seem to occur on a daily basis and so the question you may be asking is like how come how come if 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 i am everything if i was created by god to be everything how come the the frustrations of what seems to be daily experience so you know there's beautiful metaphors in the course about uh about the sunbeam and the sun and about the wave a ripple or a wave on the ocean and the ocean and that's the whole thing right there is the belief in parts if you, i mean what could the sun really know about a sunbeam except knowing itself uh what could the ocean think about a ripple or a tiny wave on the surface of something that's so vast the ocean goes all around the globe all around the world and when we believe in the ego and when we think with the ego we have this way of thinking that's called parts and whole okay and all of us are familiar with this like when you bake a pie the ingredients are the parts and the pie is the whole uh if you have a family it may have family members that are the parts and then you have the whole family or if you even talk about uh an atom <laughs> and you know that the atom has protons and neutrons and it has a nucleus people would say well the atom is the whole and those tiny little parts protons neutrons electrons are the parts what jesus is telling us in the course is that there is no difference between the part and the whole that they are actually not different at all they are the same and some of you even know the phrase um the whole transcends the sum of the parts remember that one the whole transcends the sum of the parts what jesus is telling us is that the whole and the parts are not different in any way why because there's only one of us there's only one mind god god doesn't think in parts god doesn't think in terms of parts particular specifics jesus tells us the whole world of specifics was made by the ego god is abstract love god is pure love pure oneness pure happiness pure joy eternity doesn't have parts and yet when you perceive yourself looking at time and space you must realize that to look at the world with the holy spirit is to know no difference between the parts and the whole so the it's a perceptual correction i always say there's a perceptual problem you have to first admit you have a perceptual problem what does that even mean i have a perceptual problem if you went to you know like a 12 step group hi my name is so and so and i'm an alcoholic hi my name is so and so and i'm i whatever uh i i have a drug problem 
I have whatever. I have a human, human being problem. <laughs> and what if you went in and said, hi, my name is so-and-so and I have a perceptual problem. It's basically admitting that you believe in parts and whole. You believe they're different. You believe the parts are different from the whole. That's, that's what the perceptual problem is. It's, it's a fragmentation in perception that's the problem. It's not the specifics of people, places, things, situations. That's all based on ego and linear time. So how does this relate to you? We were having a discussion because as we watch the world on a, every moment, we watch the world and we watch what seems to be arising. The only way that you could not be at peace with this world is to believe in the parts. And that's what Jesus calls authority problem. He says, you have an authority problem. Your author is God and you believe you are the author of yourself. That's what the ego has tricked the mind into believing, that it's the author of itself. And how does that relate to you on a day-to-day -day basis? Whenever you are upset in any direction or in any degree, it is always become because of the authority problem. It's because of the belief that I can author myself. There is no problem and there is no upset in experiencing I am a creation of God. I have been authored by God, eternally authored by, by God. But we were talking about this idea of autonomy. Personal autonomy seems to be a good thing. That's one thing that the mind has been accustomed to thinking that it's good to be autonomous. It's good to be an autonomous self. It's good to have autonomy. And then when I went into A Course in Miracles and I looked up the word autonomy, Jesus says, your autonomy is in your creation. In other words, when God created you in spirit, that was the gift of autonomy. In spirit. Being spirit is the true meaning of autonomy. That's how, that's how Jesus recognizes God, and that's how the recognition of the I Am Presence is, is remembered, is through the true remembrance of autonomy. And yet, the ego has made a world based on personality selves, based on, I'll do it my way, like the Frank Sinatra song. <laughs> you know, even though the song is quite uh, intense, if you know the lyrics of it, I did it my way. You know, we have to come away from that sense of my, and we have to go into thy will be done. Let me know thy will. Let me know eternal love. Let me know spirit. That's where the, the joy is. The autonomy in, in trying to believe in a separate self brings about all the struggles of the human condition. Every single struggle that you ever will experience is coming from a sense of the wish to have an autonomous, separate self apart from spirit. So, on the day-to-day -day basis, this is where we come into guidance, this is where we come into listen and follow. Anybody who comes into our communities, you know, will say, what is this listen and follow? And what does it mean? And, and I can tell you, it's just pure joy, because when you are in listen and follow, you are being sourced. You are in alignment with source. You, you are saying and meaning in the moment, I would have no separate will from you. You are letting go of control of the world, as Francis mentioned at the beginning. You, you want peace of mind more than you want to control outcomes. You want peace of mind more than you want to control the body. That's just false responsibility too, when you think, I am responsible for the condition of my body. 
I am responsible for how I look upon the body in the world. I am responsible for my perspective of the body. I am responsible for my perspective of the world, but I am not directly responsible for the body or any specific situation because I am here to see the world as a whole. And then there's a very famous line in the Course that also says, Jesus says, make this year different by making it all the same. Oh my gosh, that is like the key to happiness. Make this world, this year different by making it all the same is, is really like, a, if you were going to have a New Year's resolution, that would be the New Year's resolution, is to start to see the sameness of form. And, and by seeing the sameness of form, you realize you are in the forgiven mind. You are experiencing forgiveness. But as long as you perceive differences in form, that is the wish to have an autonomous perception, an autonomous identity, an autonomous self that is apart from God. So to me, this is fantastic. Why would I want to try to see parts different from the whole? And what would stop me from just letting go into this state of mind that accepts all things exactly as they are, except the belief in sacrifice that somehow something bad will happen if I no longer try to control the world. Mm. That's been our experiment with Tabula Rasa and we're here to share the good news. <laughs> Basically the good news is there is no negative consequence to surrendering to God. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. God is always for us. God has never been against us. Nothing's ever been against us. We were just mistaken on that. <laughs> There's the home, home crowd. There's a, they're, they're, they're panning around. <laughs> Welcome to the mystery school. <laughs> Welcome to our living room. <laughs> Yeah, I, I felt, even feel like the, with the school, it's how we live all the time. So we've opened the doors for six-week increments for people to come and experiment and experience that and face the fears and the control and the authority problem. Like, that's the opportunity is to be able to come and taste this. Just don't take our word for it to really fully step into that. And that's what all of you guys have done together. We've kind of come in together and said, okay, here we go. And really in the prayer every day to be shown, uh, you know, what is your will for me, Father? And opening up to seeing that the guidance, you know, is just naturally happening in the original yes of every one of you coming here. So it's so wonderful. It's like we've all said yes together. It's kind of like a, a ride. It's how we live. And, and uh, it's ever new. Do you have something, Francis, you want to share? Yeah, we are actually in, we just passed 30 day mark in the mystery school. So everybody has been here for exactly 30 days. And, you know, the c when we come together, this is what we are, um, the only curriculum is to learn to trust the spirit and learn to listen to the spirit's instruction for us. And what is going to show up is that this unconscious eventually would start to, to bubble up because it was very heavily controlled, the unconscious guilt. When we are going about in our daily life, um, set preferences about how we wanted to to live, how we wanted things to be, is really about how to m manage these things that cannot be managed, which is the perceptual world. And then when we come together, we're basically just saying, like David said, okay, we don't want to control this external world, and we want to yield our our will to the spirit, what is your will? And we are going to trust whatever show up. And then what happens is there will be a lot of peace and a lot of 
joy, but at the same time, this authority issue that would show up in different upsets, which ha which has been held under the conscious mind, would also bubble up. So basically, what we're seeing is a lot of the things will show up, like anger, like annoyance, and um, issues that we don't like will show up. But they are actually the curriculum. If we understand it's not problems that show up for us to get solved. Oh, I don't have a good day today, that's bad. But really, the bigger understanding is these are the what has been sitting on the unconscious mind. And once we start to line up to say, okay, only your will, thy will be done, I'm willing then all this rage sitting underneath that to compete with God's will is going to show up in very tiny, subtle, different ways with people, most likely. But this is what we wanted to, to share as a context. This is, um, this is okay. This is the, the curriculum of forgiveness that is in our face on a daily basis as well. And we're presented with what is actually sitting underneath that willing that are ready to be to be healed and to be released. And this is very simple. Even the healing is doing it in its own pace as set by the Holy Spirit. Even healing is doing that on its own. So we're just here to give our willingness to say yes, we'll allow that. Yeah, we give full permission to allow everything to come to the surface so it can be exposed. Expressing everything is the way out. I don't know why I was thinking about this one time. It, this was in the very beginning uh, years together when I first was starting to listen and follow. And uh, you had given me the opportunity to prepare for this retreat down in Kentucky. I don't know if you remember this. <laughs> and... Uh, gas was like $5 a gallon at the time. And uh, I had just started to, you know, open up to listening and following. And David had said, okay, you know, prepare for this retreat. And so I had this whole big plan, everything that I was going to do for this retreat. And I had uh, blueberry pie. I had all these things on the list that I was going to get for this uh, retreat. And... Uh, so then you called me, you and Jason called me and said there's been a change of plans. And they, you said uh, we were going to actually just stop and grab some pizza and some Coke. So scratch all those plans for a menu that you had for the retreat. I say the blueberry pie. <laughs> <laughs> it was that damn blueberry pie. <laughs> But I went nuts. <laughs> Do you remember? I was. Yeah, it was actually <laughs> Jason was with me. Jason called you, and he just very matter of factly was on the phone with you, just saying, "Well, we're going to pick up some things on the way down, and so there's no need for the blueberry pie and everything." And and then I just I was standing across from Jason, and I heard this torrent of screaming. It was like Lisa was spitting nails. <laughs> she was. She was more than hopping mad. She was more than angry. She was more than furious. She was so angry that Jason just put the phone away from his ear uh, because it just went on for a little while. It just was rage, 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 rage. And then I watched Jason, and, and you were addressing Jason pretty directly and everything, and I watched a teardrop <laughs> roll down his cheek as he's holding this phone out and everything. And and I thought, yeah, this is what forgiveness is all about. If when you have a belief in an outcome, what even a blueberry pie, if your if your mind gets set on any outcome and form, including baking a blueberry pie, that can take all your peace away. Because that's really what I was talking about. That's what an idol is. It's an idol is something that you want in form 
that you believe you'll be happy if you get that outcome, that thing. And it can be a blueberry pie, it could be a relationship, it could be, I want a sunny day instead of a rainy day. You know, it could be anything. But that was, that was very, very healing in the long run. It was because I was down at the retreat center by myself and I felt like I was like this caged animal. I mean, really, I felt so much control and so much rage and just really what it was just like this tyrant of energy and I just was with it and then just even like in the prayer and I remember laying in my bed at night and just was like you know just really facing this massive control and in the prayer too just like you know Holy Spirit help me see this differently and even seeing my resistance to asking but it was just like me just being with it and just really seeing it. It was just felt, yeah, like out of control. And I don't know, something happened. It was just me laying with it and being with it and, and facing it. And I remember it was so beautiful because like, you know, just being able to hand it over. I don't know what happened actually, but I remember that all of a sudden you guys were coming down like 10, 11 o'clock in the morning with pizza and sodas instead. And uh, it was a miracle. I saw, it was like, oh my God, just like, you know, just that I could face it and like totally <laughs> hand it over. Something happened. I don't know what happened, but it was like just totally allowance of me to be like that. And then uh, you guys pulled up in the driveway and I remember coming out and I almost like you guys were thinking, okay, what's happening in there? <laughs> Am I burning down the house? Or what? But I came out and I was like, it's a miracle. It's a real miracle. Because it was really just this full permission, you know, even on the phone with Jason and I remember, and I was screaming so loud I couldn't stop. You know, just, you know, just the full permission. And then he said, Lisa, it's me, Jason. He kept saying, it's me, Jason. I'm like, F you, man. F you. You know? <laughs> I don't care who it is. I had a plan. But it's that, you know, this, my will, our will. That's what I see. It's just my will, my control, my ideas of what I think is right and wrong, and this complete willingness. And that seems like so long ago, but... Just like this complete, you know, healing. I can feel it right now as I'm speaking. Just this total trust, seeing that God's will is our own will. You know, that that is the interference from him to be able to fully use us. And, yeah, I just feel like just this, it, that seems so long ago. But now this opening to just totally being this full vessel. It's like, oh, then there's just this beautiful... It's like we are just like a feather then. There's no interference anymore. There's ideas and thoughts and and beliefs. You know, it's just all the past. And then living in the holy, holy instant of an experience, that, like, oh, my word, you know. Uh, yeah, just that it's, yeah, words can't even describe it. It's just it's this, you want to continue to open into this holy instant, you know, letting go completely. And, yeah. Yeah, no, no more words, but just knowing that, you know, that authority problem, how strong it is and how important it is to be able to bring the darkness to the light. And that's what the expression sessions are about. That's what one-on-ones are about, you know, to be able to face it together. But then also being willing to see it differently, you know, willingness. You know, I remember you used to say this to me, and I, I love that. You said, Holy Spirit choose God for me when I'm too resistant. You know, I'm too resistant right now, but Holy Spirit, choose God for me, help me. I'm in too much resistance. And just that willingness to even ask that, you know, when you're in that intensity, it's like I, I, I want to see this differently. I, you know, it, it's like it, it's going to take a determination to see it differently. I'd rather be happy. Yeah, I think in a lot of, of Eastern philosophies, non-dual philosophies, there's a lot of talk about non-attachment. Some of you who've studied 
a lot of the deep teachings, the Vedantas, everything's about non-attachment. How does that fit with forgiveness? Well, Jesus is saying that forgiveness is simply seeing the false as false. He's saying among all these images, there's no hierarchy of illusions. The meaning of illusion is not real. So how could one not real be, be more important than another not real? That fits perfect with all the great Indian teachings on non-attachment. And I think for me, this is where you really come down to the true depth of forgiveness. I was on YouTube last night and I, I typed in uh, Jesus of Nazareth and, and up came all these scenes from the very famous movie. It's, a over, it's Franco Zeffirelli, it's over six hours long. But when I typed in Jesus of Nazareth, then all these different scenes, and then one of them I went down, scrolled down, and it said Last Supper. So it was Jesus with the apostles and the Last Supper. I said, oh, let's, let's review this scene again, the Last Supper of Jesus with the apostles. So I pushed play, and there was Jesus, and it was a big party. They were dancing, and there was lots of happiness and party, and Jesus was kind of quietly sitting with his back against the wall, and then finally... After the party died down a little, the apostles came and gathered around him, and Peter came right next to him. And then Jesus very calmly started to say things like, um, uh, in a while I, I will be with you no longer. A very short while I'll be, I won't be with you. Well, that sent a ripple. You imagine you're having dinner with your master and your master's, you know, having sipping some some drink and saying very matter of factly, very nonchalantly, very commonly, I'm not going to be with you much longer. That kind of got them stirred up and and uh, basically Peter, who was sitting right next to Jesus, said, Lord, wherever you're going, I'm going with you. And he's like, No, 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 Peter. Where I'm going, you're not ready to go. Peter was very upset. He was like, I, he was protesting to show his loyalty. No, 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 I, I tell you, I will go with you wherever you go. And Jesus was very calm, and he, he just kind of calmly looked over at Peter, and he said, before the cock crows, the rooster, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. You will deny that you even know me. Now this is where we start to get down to the authority problem. We have a human being that's right next to Jesus who's wanting to profess his loyalty like, no, wherever you're going to go, I'm going with you. And Jesus is saying, you're not ready. You know, there will come a time when you will, will lead others to me. He was talking about Peter was the one that Jesus said, I will, Peter is a rock, I'll build my church. St. Peter was the one that, that the church rose up to teach the teachings of Jesus. But at that moment, was in the, the Last Supper, he was basically saying, no, you'll, you'll deny that you even know me three times before the cock crows. And, and then that really sent Peter off, no, no, Lord. He was now going to convince Jesus <laughs> that he knew more than Jesus. <laughs> and so then he started protesting quite loud, no, never. He, Peter looked at Jesus and said, never. That's how offended he was <laughs> that Jesus would even say, before the cock crows, you will deny that you even know me three times. Now this just showed me, when I watched that scene last night, I thought, wow, that just shows how thick the ego's mesmerism is. It goes beyond personal lo loyalty. It goes beyond the loyalty of seemingly Went, been with Jesus for three years. The apostles were with him for three years of public teaching. And then here down in this final last supper that they're having is suddenly the unconscious mind. It was coming up, that, like you were saying, it was coming up for Peter, like, no, 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 never. I, I see, he looked right, Jesus in the eye and says, never. <laughs> you know, like, almost like, <laughs> in front of everybody here saying, I'm going to deny <laughs> Did I even know you? Never. You know, but, but Jesus was, 
was in a state of mind that is just so absolutely connected and one that realized, no, this isn't about the words. It isn't about what the scenes that will seem to come next. This is about how much God loves us, that we all are connected in spirit. And nothing that you can say or do in form will change that love. That this is about seeing the false as false. The Christ was in such a state of mind that it could just look upon the world of images, this theater, this play, I'm calling the Last Supper, and it could just look upon that with the same detachment and the same glowing love as any other scene of like taking a walk on a sunny day with the apostles. It was the same thing of saying, I'm not going to be with you that much longer. Because as I've said about the cross, we're here to have the vertical beam, the vertical perspective of the cross, the right-mindedness, the forgiveness, of truly seeing that the images can't tell us who we are. Because God, as Spirit, created us as the Christ. And these images cannot fool us. That's what Jesus was really teaching. That don't be fooled by what the images say or do. Don't be fooled into believing you can be mistreated. He says that in the Course. Beware of the temptation to perceive yourself unfairly treated. Wow, is that a deep temptation. That's, that's been a defining temptation of our whole life. I was mistreated. I could have, my parents could have treated me better. My siblings could have treated me better. My coworkers. And then I go through all this. I come to A Course in Miracles community and you'd think the people at the Course in Miracles community would treat me <laughs> with love. Don't they know the Pat Benatar song? <laughs> Treat me right. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> you know, it's like, if I can't get treated fairly at A Course in Miracles Mystery School, what chance, what chance do I have? But see, Jesus is with us inside saying, keep coming to me. I know how strong you are. I know you're a child of God. I know your innocence. I know your strength. I know your perfection, your perfection. God created you perfect. And that is in spirit. So to me, this is why we have expression sessions. This is, we have, there are more sessions of allowance. It's more like allow it on up, allow all of it up, allow any of it up. Uh, I remember we, we had a road trip. Uh, we have a, had a friend years ago named Stu who said, uh, hey, I'm following you guys on the internet and I'm loving it. And I've got a house out in Northern California and you're welcome to just, just come right on in, take over my house and have one of those retreats uh, at my house. It's a nice big house. It's got a lot of acres. So uh, Lisa and, and a group of us went out there and... I remember when I was out at that house one day, I was in, in my bedroom uh, just praying and meditating and they were getting ready for the daily lunch expression session. And I wasn't really feeling hungry, I was just praying in my room, meditating, but then the Holy Spirit said, go to the lunch. So I actually got up, went down the hall and came in and they were having soup and maybe some other toast and a few other things. So I went over and I got my bowl and I scooped myself some soup and I looked, it was a big square table and there was only one spot on the corner that has one chair left and I went, oh, there's my spot. So I came and I took my soup and I sat down and I sat there and it was an expression session. The woman sitting next to me I just started having my soup. I was taking the spoon up and just starting eating. She went into full-blown rage. She started taking her fist and pounding on the table. And my bowl was going like this. And somebody apparently st got their iPhone out and started filming the whole thing. Jenny, I think Jenny or somebody. And so 
I sat there and enjoyed my meal because <laughs> I was guided to have some lunch and I was that expression. So I sat there and, and the video, I think it's still on the internet, is me. <laughs> you can hear the bowl and the silverware clanking as she's with both fists pounding, pounding, hammering the table. And I'm like, <laughs> I look like, like the Buddha. I wasn't even looking at her, I was just... <laughs> and, and to me, some people, a few people said, I think Diana was... Uh, yeah, she said the reason that she actually came to the community was she saw that, <laughs> that film on the internet. And she said, whatever that is, <laughs> I, I'm, I, want, I want to go toward that. Because I had absolutely... The reaction. And it, it was like a storm. It came and it went. She did, it was total allowance for it all and, and she ended up just coming very calm through the whole thing. You were, you were there, you remember that. I, I think it went to the end where she even kind of just settled down. Yeah, and yeah, it got very quiet. It was like, oh very my still. word, just, yeah, just that came right into this stillness with it all. Yeah, really beautiful. But these are just examples of what I'm talking about, like forgive means see the false as false. Because we're never really upset by what's happening. We're only upset by our interpretation of what's happening. Obviously, if Jesus you know, went through the whole thing carrying the cross and they, they hammered the spikes in his arms and his legs and then reportedly from the cross he said forgive them for they know not what they do that doesn't really sound like an angry <laughs> an angry expression that's that's quite meek forgive them for they know not what they do and and in the context of having blood pouring down from your arms and legs and having spikes driven through and you're hanging on a wooden cross that seems like a pretty extraordinary uh, statement Forgive them, for they know not what they do. It must have been from a state of mind of forgiveness. It must have been from complete non-attachment, from seeing the false as false, from realizing that there are no appearances that can change what God created as one in spirit. God created Christ as spirit, and even if you fall asleep and have amnesia and forget that you're the Christ, still you must always have it within you to remember. That was the movie The Lion King, that was my favorite scene when Simba goes way off to the far lands, leaves the, the pride lands and goes way off and then when he's, Narla comes to get him and when he's coming back uh, his father Muf Mufasa, who's passed away, is just this voice of James Earl Jones <laughs> in the sky, remember, remember. <laughs> That's all it takes, is that. And then he's able to look into the pond and see a reflection and, and the monkey, Rafiki, is saying, look, look deeper, because he's saying, that's, that's just my reflection in a pond. That's the surface reflection. If you look at your, in the mirror, you see it, the image reflected back. But Jesus is telling us, remember who you are. Remember who created you. Remember that time and space can never really trick you because it didn't trick me. He was tempted to believe in the same world, in the same illusion. And he was saying, just remember, I remembered the truth. You can remember it too. It's destined. It's inevitable. The trick cannot last because God's will is more powerful than a trick. God's will is forever. So that's, that's powerful. These kind of scenes are just reminding us, oh yeah, that's the larger context. That's what this is all about. It's not about whether I can do the task right or if I meet my quota or if I impress somebody or if I prove something. Those are all ego motivations because they're all on the timeline. They're all horizontal.